Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you for joining me for the remainder of my One Night in Cars on card review. There are going to be three more videos. There's going to be this video where we're going to cover the class cards that I haven't covered yet. There's going to be a fourth video where I cover the neutral cards that I haven't touched on yet. And then there's going to be a fifth video where I'm going to do some uh, overview and some insights into my opinions on the overall design of One Night in Cars on and some predictions that I have. So without further ado, let's kick it off. First off, we've got Menagerie Warden. It's 5-5 five, five for 6 for Druid, and its effect is pick a friendly beast you control and summon a copy of it. This card is phenomenal. This card is really, really strong. At its absolute worst, it's a 5-5, five, five, even if you hit nothing. If you do hit something, then it's going to be insanely valuable. Even if you hit Enchanted Raven, it's basically a 7-7 seven, seven for 6, which is fairly strong, and the chances of you being able to hit something more valuable are pretty high. Uh, the dream of this card is obviously Stranglethorn Tiger on 5 into this on 6, in which case you get a 10-10, half of which has stealth for 6 mana. Really super strong. This card is going to be even more so than Enchanted Raven, the card that bumps Beast Druid up to a spot where it can actually win some games on ladder, where it's actually viable, where you might actually see it even in tournament play. Menagerie Warden is a game-breaking, meta-altering level card. Uh, even in Arena, actually, it's pretty good because there are a lot of neutral beasts and there are a lot of beasts you might still take as a druid. It's very feasible for you to have a decent number of Druid of the Claw. It's feasible for you to have things like Huge Toad. It's feasible for you to have things like even like Oasis Snapjaw and River Crocolisk that aren't great, but you take them to fill out your curve. That would be legal targets for Menagerie Warden. And even at its worst, it's a 5-5 five, five for 6. Even if you can't manage to hit anything, it's still a better body uh, than a lower drop minion, and it can hit the board and actually have some impact. Amazing card overall. Okay, so next up, we've got Moonglade Portal. Uh, it's a 6-cost spell that heals a target for 6 and gives you a random 6-drop, which is 6 mana. So you'd already pick 6 mana for a 6-drop, and you're just getting 6 health in exchange for not getting to pick what that 6-drop is. That's fine. Uh, the average stats on a 6-drop are something a little over an average of 6 attack and 6 health each, so slightly worse than Boulder Fist Ogre, but if there was a version of Boulder Fist Ogre, if they'd printed a creature that was a 6-6 six, six for 6 that heals somebody for 6 when you play it, it would have gotten a ton of play. And likewise, I think Moonglade Portal is going to see a lot of play. I think you're going to see it in Cthulhu Druid, I think you're going to see it in Yogg Druid, I think you're going to see it in like mid rangey Druid type archetypes. I think it's great. You might even see it in Beast Druid, who knows? Uh, in Arena, this card is going to be a total blowout. It's in the rare slot, so it's fairly feasible that you're going to see it, and you drop it, you play it on curve, you get six of your health back because it's Arena and you're going to be trading back and forth on health, especially with Druid's Hero Power. You get six health back, you get a guy that is on curve that is probably good. This card is phenomenal. Very, very strong in Arena and Constructed alike. Okay, so moving on to the Hunter cards, we've got Cloaked Huntress. She's a 3-4 for 3, though while she's in play, all your secrets are free. Very strong, but I think a little deceptive also, because when you see this card, you kind of think, oh, well, I can play her, then I can play as many secrets as I want, woohoo, but... Hunter secrets are kind of tactical and they're kind of tricky, and you don't always just want to dump them all, especially on turn three. Uh, against some super aggressive decks like Zoo, it might be really good to just play this on turn three and then go Explosive Trap, Bear Trap, Explosive Trap, Snake Trap, Explosive Trap, Freezing Trap, whatever. Play a couple of traps that can really disable their early aggression, but that also means you have to play cards like Explosive Trap or Snake Trap in a Hunter deck, which right now isn't super great, even with Cloak Tuntress as support. Um, overall, I think it's a fine card. I think you're going to see it in mid-range Hunter. I think you're going to see Eagle Horn Bow and a couple of secrets make it in alongside this card, uh, trading out for some of the other middle-range threats, maybe even for like Huge Toad or something like that. Um, I don't think it'll be the prominent archetype, but I think you'll see versions of it that up their win rate against Zoo and other aggressive decks by playing the early Cloak Tuntress plus Explosive Trap combo. In Arena, it's an okay card. It's a 3-4 three, for 3. What's wrong with that? If you happen to get value off of it, that's swell. But at its absolute worst, it's a 3-4 three, for 3, which is actually passable. It can fill your curve out and be pretty good. Um, so in Arena, it's like, a, okay, that's, this is fine. Like I'm not upset about it, I guess. But if you happen to get any value off of it, it's phenomenal. All right, Cat Trick. Uh, speaking of Hunter Secrets, this is a Hunter Secret that when your opponent plays a spell, you summon a 4-2 Panther with stealth. So you basically get a, uh, a Jungle Panther when your opponent casts a spell. Now, the interesting thing about this card is the wording of it. After your opponent casts a spell, you get a 4-2 Panther with stealth. So what this means is that if your opponent consecrates your board, after Consecrate resolves you then get a 4-2 Panther with stealth. If they Twisting Nether you, if Handlock Twisting Nethers your board, 
after that, you immediately get a 4-2 Panther with stealth, which means next turn you have a body, they can't follow up with targeted removal, and it's a beast enabler, so you can do something like Ram Wrangler, Kill Command, whatever, immediately the next turn. For those reasons, I actually think Cat Trick's pretty strong. It's going to only show up in mid-range. It's not going to show up in Face Hunter, obviously, but I think it's pretty cool. In Arena, it's actually significantly less good because you can't reliably expect to get that kind of tricky value off of it. Um, not everybody plays a lot of spells in Arena, and when they do, they're not always the type that it's going to be super advantageous for you to get out after. Um, a 4-2 body for 2 is great, but there's a fair chance that you could play this and your opponent can just beat the hell out of you with minions because you didn't play a minion on turn 2, uh, and they just curve out on you and they never play a spell on this card dies. Much like Dark Trap, it's very valuable, but it's easy to play around. So I don't think you'll see a lot of this in Arena, and when you do, I don't think it's going to be terribly impactful. All right, uh, moving on to mage cards now. We have Medivh's Valet. It's a 2-3 two, for 2 that does 3 damage to something when it comes into play if you control a secret. It's basically a tiny little fire elemental that only costs 2, has a decent stat line, and is in mage, but requires a secret to trigger. I don't know how I feel about this card. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to see play in anything other than, like, Reno Freeze Mage, like Ice Block decks, they can reliably keep a secret in play for most of the game and also don't have a lot of competition for card slots, I think you might see them play Medivh's Valet. Um, it's not terrible. If you get the trigger, it's actually extremely powerful. It's like getting a free 2-3 body on your Frostbolt, which man, there's no problem with that at all. I just, I'm just i not confident that the synergies it requires to hit its full value are going to be present enough in the metagame for you to see this card a lot. In Arena... Eh, it's okay. 2-3 stat lines are cool in Arena, but they're not amazing, just like in Constructed. And you cannot reliably get and have in play secrets in Arena, so your chance of getting the full value off of Medivh's Valet in Arena is, is much lower. Um, and so I, I would rate this card fairly low for Arena. I don't think you're going to see a lot of it. And again, it's not going to be super good when you do see it. Except in those rare cases where you have somebody get like Mad Scientist, Mad Scientist, five uh, secrets, and this guy, then you know they're going to blow out. But they're probably going to blow out with or without Medivh's Valet. It's kind of a win more in that case. All right, Paladin cards. We've got Nightbane Templar. It's a 2-3 for three that, if you're holding a dragon, summons two 1-1 one, one whelps, which I th think we can also presume are dragons. This card is fucking nuts. This card is a Chilwin Yeti for three, split among three guys, two of which have a relevant tribal identity. It's really good. This card alone might actually bring us from not really seeing Dragon Paladin to seeing Dragon Paladin, right? Like this, to a lesser extent, another Spite Historian and Bookworm, but definitely this card is going to bring Dragon Paladin from obscurity into relevancy in a very serious way. It's an extremely powerful card. It fights Zoo really well because it creates three bodies. It's not super uh, vulnerable to single target removal, and it's a ton of stats for three mana. It's just super good. You're going to see a ton of this. In Arena, eh, it's kind of the opposite. It's going to generally be a 2-3 three for 3, which is horrible. Very bad. 2-3s two for 2 are barely good enough. So 2-3s for 3 aren't really competitive at all. And it's very hard to reliably get dragons in your hand in Arena. So this card's basically trash uh, for Arena purposes. All right, second Paladin card, Silvermoon Portal. Uh, give a minion plus 2 plus 2, summon a random 2-cost minion, and the smell costs 4. I don't really think this is very good. Two-cost minions are very all over the place. There's no guarantee they're going to be anything good. There's something like a 17% chance that you... Uh, is it 17? No, it's not 17, but 7. It, it's a pretty good chance that you get some shit like Doomsayer or some other two-drop like Nat the Dark Fisher that you just really don't want that's actually actively bad for you. And plus two, plus two for four mana just doesn't impact the board. It doesn't do anything. This card is worse than Blessing of Kings because generally uh, you're not even going to on average get like a two, two that can immediately impact the board with this from the two cost minion drop part of it. You would rather actually just have plus four, plus four on a thing that can already impact the board. Also because of the way it's worded, you actually can't... Uh, you can't play this on an empty board, right? So the its ability to summon a minion, which can help you keep tempo as you do other things, is lost because you have to have a minion in play anyway to play this card. Silver Room Portal, it's very, very bad. Same applies to Arena. It's slightly better in Arena, again, because of lower card quality, but 
in general, it just doesn't have enough of, of an impact on the board. You're not going to want to skip your four drop to play a plus two, plus two. And then if you're lucky, a two, two or two, three minion, it's really not worth it. This card in the trash bin. No good. Okay, so onto the rogue cards, we've got Swash Burglar. He's a 1 1 for 1 who is a pirate, and when you put him into play as a battle cry, he adds a random card from your opponent's class to your hand. This is the card that brings Thief Rogue together. This is a way better version of Undercity Huckster, in my opinion. Uh, he's a 1 1, and he's a pirate, and he only costs 1, and it's a battle cry, so they can't negate it by hexing, polymorphing, whatever, silencing your minion, um, and that card, like a 1-1 one, one for 1 that draws a card is crazy. People will play to 1-1 one, one for 2 that draws a card, and that's, that's you know, good enough, so a 1-1 one, one for 1 that draws a card is insane. Uh, the card's not quite as good, but it doesn't come from your deck, so it doesn't count against your fatigue. I think you're going to see a whole ton of this card. I think you're going to see a lot of it. I don't know if you're necessarily going to see Thief Rogue, the taking cards from your opponent's class, ethereal, peddler type deck. I don't know if you're going to see that catch on necessarily as a viable deck, um, but I think this card specifically is extremely good. In Arena, it's even better because the card quality, again, is generally lower. So getting a random card from your opponent's class is basically just getting a card that's probably just as good as the cards in your deck. You probably have throwaways and weak cards in your deck, so even if you get a shitty card, unless you get a truly worthless card like Shatter, Power Word, Tentacles, or something, it's generally going to be really good. Class cards are generally better than neutral cards also, so Swashbuckler, Swashburglar, amazing. Deadly Fork. Uh, it is a 3-2 three, for 3. Then when it dies, it gives you a 3-2 weapon that costs 3. It doesn't say that on the card, but that's how it works. Whew, this card is bad. Um... If you tried to put it out as a 3-2 for 6 that gave you a 3-2 weapon when you played it, that would be, I mean, that's, that would just be one of the worst cards uh, in Rogue, right? It just isn't good enough. A 3-2 hitting the board on, on turn 3 just gets traded up with by a 2-1 for 1 or a 2-2 for 2. It just gets immediately killed, and you've got this 3-2 weapon that is no better than if you just hero-powered and played Deadly Poison. Right, so it's basically like getting a deadly poison in your hand because it doesn't not compatible with your hero power. It's very bad. Deadly fork is total trash. In arena, it's slightly better, but again, it just dies when you play it on curve too easily. It gets traded up with too easily. You know, it dies to to two ones. It dies to one ones plus hero power. It's just not good enough. It's very weak, very poorly statted, very poorly costed. The weapon that you get on the other side of it is too expensive. Everything about it is just bad. Bad card. All right, so going into Shaman now, we've got Wicked Witch Doctor. This is a 3-4 four for 4 that summons a random basic totem every time you cast a spell. So my question for you is, in what way is Wicked Witch Doctor better than Violet Teacher? Violet Teacher is a 3-5, Violet Teacher is neutral, and Violet Teacher can reliably give you creatures that have an attack value. So the answer to the question, by the way, is in super totem heavy decks, uh, decks that play things like Thing From Below and possibly even Drain A Totem Carver, things that care about having totems in play because of things like Thunderbolt Valiant. But even in those cases, I just feel like it's not good enough. A 3-4 isn't quite tough enough. The difference between 3-4 and 3-5 is actually pretty huge. Uh, that extra one health makes a big difference, and it's part of the reason the Violet Teacher is as good as it is, is because it's sticky. It's got that magical five health point where it doesn't die to anything that does four. Um, this card obviously doesn't have that, and it has a chance of just doing things like Healing Totem or Taunt Totem at times that you don't need them. Um, the Spell Pirate Totem is cool, but... Really, I would rather just play Violet Teacher in almost any case that I would play this. It's even worse in Arena, where you can't have the Totem Synergy that could potentially make this outclass Violet Teacher. So, overall, Wicked Witch Doctor's fairly weak. Uh, it's a decent body, but it just doesn't compete with other similar cards, and it gets traded up against somewhat easily uh, by things with a 4 power. It dies to the mini removal effects that do 4 damage, like Swipe, True Silver Champion, things like that. It's just a pretty weak card overall. A Spirit Claws is a 1-3 weapon for 1 that is plus 2 attack while you have spell damage. The problem with this card, and the reason it isn't super, super good, it isn't basically just a better version of Fiery War Axe, is because there aren't a ton of ways to reliably get spell damage in Shaman, and holding the weapon for a long time kind of negates the benefit of it being a 1-mana thing. It's competing with Tunnel Trog, and Tunnel Trog is really, really good. 
Um, and the only way to reliably get spell power early is by playing neutral cards like Blood Mage Thalnos or like Kobold Geomancer, or by getting lucky and happening to roll a um, spell power totem when you hero power on turn two, which you basically lose if you need to have that three weapon, three attack weapon on turn two, and you lose the, the one and four roll for getting spell power totem. So this card, I think, looks way better than it is, unfortunately. Spell power. Shaman is just not really a... It's an, not, not an archetype. It's not a viable way of doing it. Shaman already has multiple viable archetypes, so they didn't need a new one. So I'm kind of glad this isn't better than it is. Um, but I think it's actually pretty underwhelming. You might see it in a couple of fringe decks like Control Shaman that might play a bunch of spell spell damage effects, you know, Azure Drake and Blood Mage Thanos and stuff like that. But overall, I think this card's pretty weak. Um, in Arena, it's even worse because you really can't reliably get spell damage and... A 1-3 weapon just doesn't cut it in Arena. You know, nobody picks Light's Justice, that's a 1-4, right? So you're not going to see Spirit Claws do much work for you in Arena, especially in the common slot of a class card, right, where there are other better common uh, Shaman class cards like Tunnel Trog. Finally for Shaman, uh, we have Maelstrom Portal. Maelstrom Portal, it's a 2-cost spell, does 1 damage to all enemy minions, summons a random 1-drop. You might be familiar with this effect, we call it Arcane Explosion, and it didn't have that second part. So Shaman basically just got a strictly better version of Arcane Explosion, which is really strange. Um, it doesn't seem to really fit in with Shaman very well. It's not an overload card, and Shaman isn't necessarily like the king of AoE and the king of low damage for spells. Um, but despite not fitting in, I think it's actually quite good. Uh, I think that Midrange Shaman and even Face Shaman uh, will probably play one or two of this just as an extra early tool against Zoo. Um, I mean, it's kind of a beating if you drop something like, you know, say, turn one Tunnel Trog, turn two Totem Golem, turn three Maelstrom Portal against Zoo, because you would just take out a bunch of their one health guys and do a, and bring yourself in a 1-1. One, 1-1s one. One, are, you know, pretty crappy, but they don't have any, like, standout terribleness in them. Even the, some of the worst 1-1s one you can get, like Shield Bear, are still fine in the matchups where you're going to want to play Maelstrom Portal early. In other matchups, you basically are just playing a random 1-drop that costs 1 more, and maybe you can pick off a minion. But in the end, it's a 2-cost spell, so it's not that big of a deal, uh, especially in decks that are really consistent, like all the shaman archetypes are right now um in arena i think it'll be fine i don't think it'll be actually as good as it is in constructed because playing on curve is so important in arena and playing this on curve isn't really going to get you anywhere in 85 percent of cases so this is generally going to be a non-pick in arena especially in the rare slot which means it's up against things like feral spirit which is always good um but in constructed this is going to have a big impact especially in the matchup against zoo and pirate warrior and stuff like that all right, so warrior cards. This is like my one of my favorite classes. Uh, first off, for warrior, we've got Fool's Bane. It is a three-four weapon for five that it can attack an unlimited number of times every turn, but it can't hit face. It cannot attack the enemy hero. As much as I love warrior, this card is booty. It is not good enough. It doesn't compare to things like Brawl at the same mana cost. Yes, you can play this and oh, I can play this and immediately kill like four guys. That's cool. But three health guys generally have three or four attack, which means you're taking somewhere between nine and 12 damage. Whereas if you'd played Brawl, you would have killed all those guys except one maybe. And then you wouldn't have taken any damage. Like it just doesn't feel good enough. It feels like the mana cost is just a little bit too high for this card to really be a strong candidate for AoE removal, and a class that already has some of the best AoE removal. Um, in Arena, it'll be a little better. Uh, in Arena, it's more likely that you can hold on to it for a while and that you can pick off advantageous targets with it, but you're still taking a bunch of damage uh, when you use Fool's Bane. That's why it's named that. Um, and it's just not going to really compete with other things. It's only saving graces that in Arena it's at it's the common slot, and there are a few common warrior cards that you would want to take this over. But all in all, I think Fool's Bane's actually, well, kind of a fool's bargain. Ironforge Portal. Uh, it's a five-cost spell. You get four armor and a random four drop. This card's awesome. Uh, it basically summons a random body that gets like a pseudo shield maiden effect. Um, you can play it on curve and get a four drop. Four drops are usually fine. In fact, that four, five, six drop section is where the, the drops are the least differentiated on a step-by-step -step basis. So paying five mana for a four drop isn't really a huge degradation in mana efficiency, but you just tack four mana on there and bada bing, bada boom, it's a really good spell. Um, the same exact thing goes in arena. It's in the common slot. You get a random four drop. It fills your curve out, gives you four armor, just kind of gives you a little bit of an advantage 
and gives you a card that is basically on curve. It's a great card. Ironforge Portal, just simple, not a lot to think about here. Four drops are good. Ma armor is good. One mana for four armor is good. It's a good card. You know what? We're just we're gonna come back to purify. We're gonna skip. I can't. Priest of the Feast um, is a three six for four that when you cast a spell heals you for three. It's a pretty good card. Um, I think this card's actually getting a bad rap. Um, and uh, the same way that Bookworm is kind of good because it has three attack, it's the same reason that Crazed Worshipper has find it, found its way back into the meta, that there are a lot of key minions of three attack. Uh, Priest of the Feast is a three attack, six health minion that is a four drop, so it can fight with stuff. And it's in Priest, which really benefits from high health, lower attack minions that it can heal with its effects and continue to draw value out of. Add to the fact that this guy allows you to fight on curve against decks like Zoo or Face Shaman in a really efficient way, and I think this is actually a pretty good card that you will actually see make its way into some kind of like controlly but not Nizoth style priest decks, right? This will this will probably replace Shifting Shade in most priest decks. Um, it's really strong. Like, I mean, okay, imagine the dream scenario is that you Say you drop this on turn four, you're on the draw, you go um, Priest of the Feast, Coin Power, Red Shield. You have a 3-8, you gain six life. That's really strong, actually. Won't be nearly as good in Arena. It's much weaker in Arena because you can't reliably have a lot of spells that you want to cast or spells that you want to cast that are inexpensive. So in the best case scenario, it's generally a 3-6 that might get you three life in Arena. But in Constructed, where Priest already has, you know, Circle of Healing, Flash Heal, uh, Shadow Word Pain, Power Word Shield, etc., all these 1-2, one, 0, 1, and 2 kind of costed spells, I think Priest of the Feast is actually very underrated. I think it's a very good card. All right, Onyx Bishop. Onyx Bishop is what you get when you take the spell Resurrect and you take a spider tank and you smash them into each other. It is a 3-4 three, for three with a two mana premium added to it to cast a two mana effect. The problem is that that two mana effect isn't generally played very much. It isn't very good. It isn't very reliable. And a 3-4 three, for three is simply average. Again, not very good. Not quite good enough to get played in most things. So when you take these two mediocre things and you smash them together, you get... A mediocre thing. Onyx Bishop just doesn't impress me. It's got anti-synergy with itself. If you're playing like a resurrect deck, a 3-4 body is exactly the sort of thing you don't want to have in your deck because it dilutes your resurrect pool. So you might play it only as a one of, even though it has a, a resurrect effect on it, and it's the only other card except for resurrect to have that effect, you still might only play it as a one as in a deck themed around that effect because the body is so crap. Um, in Arena, it's a little better. I mean, if it resurrects a 1-1, one, one, you basically got a 4-5 for 5, which is mediocre. If it resurrects a 2-2, two, two, you have a 5-6 five, for 5, which is fine. Um, it'll be playable in Arena, but again, I don't think I'll ever be terribly happy about it. Priest is already very weak in Arena, and so Onyx Bishop isn't going to really change that. It's not going to be a, the saving grace, especially in the rare slot. Okay, all right, so I can't put this off anymore. This card is Fucking terrible. The, I, I'm, I'm speechless about how bad Purify is. Uh, nobody plays Silence. Like, like there's a zero cost spell that is a basic card that every priest can play two copies of and spend no mana on that can silence enemy and allied minions. Right? This card. Cost two has a generally negative effect and draws you a card. There's so many things they could have done with Purify to make it a card. And instead, it's just kind of a joke. Worst card in, 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 in the, the whole card pool, right? It's the worst card in Hearthstone. Uh, not even going to discuss Constructed versus Arena. It's just this card is fucking terrible. It's it's unrepentantly bad it has no redeeming qualities the cases in which you would play it to do a cool trick eerie statue plus this would be better as eerie statue plus silence because then you could just cast the silence on turn 5 and attack for 7 and still have 5 mana it's just purifies fucking terrible it's just bad 
All right, so purify. Fuck. That wraps it up uh, for the the class cards for one night in Karazhan. Uh, thank you for joining me. We'll have another video out uh, within the next couple days, probably tomorrow, that is going to cover the neutral cards that I haven't touched yet, as well as Morose, who I missed. Sorry, Morose. You're, you're so stealthy. I just I lied. Didn't even notice you there. Um, so please uh, check out the next video. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Make me feel good about myself, please. You're the only one who can do that. You specifically, viewer person. Um, be sure to check out uh, my other project, the Play Together Project. Uh, we are a tabletop gaming group with a focus on progressive political advocacy. We play uh, tabletop games at 8 p.m. EST at twitch.tv slash the Play Together Project. So if those two things that I mentioned, you know, games and, and politics sound cool to you, you should you come watch. And if not, then keep watching my videos. And in either case, thank you so much for watching part three of my One Night in Cars on Card review. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, okay. I'm gonna... Okay, just... Goodbye. Thank you for... Bye. All right.